Hello, I'm Dylan. And I'm Keon. This is Trust Your Doctor, that podcast with Jim Henson Cybermen, because this week we watched The Next Doctor. Written by Russell T. Davies. Directed by Andy Goddard. And aired on December 25th, 2008. Okay, this is very exciting, because I've waited 206 <laughs> episodes to be able to say this. <laughs> well, p- plus like the other well, 30 plus, episodes plus we the, did. <laughs> plus all the episodes we did between the TV movie and Rose plus all the other random audio drama episodes. But anyway, I've been waiting since January of 2014. Was it 2014? To yeah. say this. Yep. This was the very first episode <laughs> of Doctor Who that I ever watched was The Next Doctor. And it didn't make you, you know, stop watching the show and, you know, never touch it again. So congrats. <laughs> no, but Because if this was the first me. episode of Doctor Who that I ever watched, I would probably never watch it again. <laughs> Both, I was both really because, confused. Yeah, both because this isn't like a very good introduction to Doctor Who because of like what goes on, and also because I just found it to be a pretty boring episode for the most part. I mean, I have a lot of nostalgia around this episode because of that, <laughs> so I think my opinion of this episode is very, very biased. Well, didn't you? Didn't you just? I mean, you started Doctor Who like a few months before we started this podcast, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh God. Yeah. Just goes to show you how like janky this was in terms of how it was put together <laughs> back in the day. Back in the day, implying it's not <laughs> still kind of janky. I mean, in terms of how much we know about Doctor Who, which like isn't, you know, that much even uh, today, but mm-hmm. back then it was basically nothing. Well, back then I think it was nothing for you anyway. <laughs> yeah, it was nothing for, for me. For me, it wasn't nothing, but only because I had watched like... A couple Not episodes. That many. Actually, I watched this originally like 2009, I think, 2010. What? Yeah. So like five years before? Like before the 11th Doctor had even had any episodes yet. Uh-huh. We watched this, Planet of the Dead, Waters of Mars, and then that was it. We watched those three. Because I don't think when we watched them, I don't think uh, End of Time was out yet. So we watched those three, and then... We, we stopped for some reason, and then, like, right before we started this podcast, we went back and we started with Partners in Crime, and we watched through the end of the 10th Doctor, and then we watched all of the 11th Doctor, and then we went back and watched series one, two, and three. Huh. That's a very strange way of watching these first four seasons. <laughs> yeah, well, by the time we got back to it, uh, Matt Smith had already Done skedaddled thing. through the role, yeah. <laughs> Then Peter Capaldi was the first Doctor that we... Well, yeah, when I say we, I'm referring to, like, my family and I. But anyway, Peter Capaldi was the first Doctor me. that we watched, like, live, I guess, quote-unquote. Okay. So, yeah. This was the first episode of Doctor Who I ever watched. That's why I have a lot of nostalgia for this theme tune as well. Huh. All right. But anyway, it begins just with the Doctor just landing in London in, like, the 1860s. Yeah, it's, like, it's oh, Christmas man, Day. It's Christmas. And, you know... I uh, enjoy how little this episode focused on it actually being Christmas. Yeah, I think it was only brought up like now and then. At the end, basically. It's briefly mentioned in the middle when the clock strikes midnight and Rosalita's like, it's midnight, it's Christmas now. Yeah, but I really appreciate like how not Christmas focused these Christmas specials are because mm-hmm. of just how stale that would be year after year. Like, yeah, in, wait um, till we get to Stephen Moffat. In, uh, what was it called? Oh, God. <laughs> the one with the Titanic. Um, Voyage you know, of the Damned. Right. That, was, that wasn't, that was you know, too heavily Christmas related. Mm-hmm. None of Nor- the Russell T ones have been really Christmas, like super Christmas themed. No. Except for the Christmas invasion where we had the robots who were like Christmas themed trying to kill even, everyone. But even and still. The Christmas tree was trying to kill everyone. And I mean, less so. I mean, Runaway Bride was definitely not Christmas focused at all. <laughs> I think this is actually the first one that didn't have any Christmas songs playing during it. I and think you're right. Probably also because it took place in the 1850s. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what was the exact where year it's, it took place? 1851. 51, which is yeah. like either these songs, you know, that we know now as classic Christmas staples weren't around yet or like, you know, back then if you wanted to hear music, you had to like listen to it live. There was like no other way to hear it. <laughs> That's actually something I just recently thought about, not related to watching this episode, but, you know, just coincidentally, I was like, wait a minute, before, like, the early 1900s, late 1800s, mm-hmm. if you wanted to hear music, you had to, like, either play it yourself or be or near someone concert, yeah. playing it. Or be <laughs> near someone who's, yeah. <laughs> music was, like, a rarity 
back in the days, really. Yeah. It's... Like to hear music meant that you had like status because you you would have to like pay to have someone else play it for you. Or you or, could just I mean, get not lucky. Yeah, I, I guess. Stand outside the concert hall and listen <laughs> through the doors. <laughs> just listening to plays like outside the Globe Theater, <laughs> ear against the wall. <laughs> you like, what's going on? <laughs> Romeo, Romeo, where for art thou, Romeo? Anyway, now the doctor... Doctor wanders around a bit. Well, he hears someone calling for the doctor, and he's like, that's me. And he runs up, and then this lady is like... Who are you? And he's like, I'm the doctor. Yeah, Rosita. And she's like, no, you're not. Ida. Yeah. Yeah. She even sounds like Rose sometimes. A couple of her lines she said, and I was like, is that Billy Piper? Well, she was supposed to be, and I'm only bringing this up because of like how odd it is, but she, and and how like, and how much this episode focused like also on prostitution, which was weird. Like she was supposed to be a prostitute, right? I don't know. There's, I mean, there's this line later where Hardigan says, like, she implies that, like, the doctor and um, what, I forget, you know, the faux Jackson, doctor, right, Blake. Jackson. The doctor and Jackson are walking next to her, and she, there's a line there that implies that, like, you know, that she's a prostitute, but I don't, I don't know. know. I don't know. I mean, maybe. Yeah, I'd have to watch it again with that idea in mind. Even having watched this three times. <laughs> I still don't really know. I think it's probably, there's probably references to it. Russell T probably didn't want to make it too overt because then the BBC censors would crack down hard on him. Well, I mean, Hardigan definitely is. There's plenty, you know, there to indicate that Hardigan is. <laughs> right. I don't know. They were pl- pretty Honestly. actually explicit about, well, you know, with Hardigan. Mm-hmm. I mean, short of like just saying, I'm like her saying, I'm a prostitute or like someone saying, you're a prostitute. They got like, you know, as close as they possibly could. Yeah, I mean, but it's still it's still like up in the air, which is the sure. point. Yeah, the BBC would have just cracked down hard if they were. I'm a prostitute. <laughs> well, I mean, really, is there no like BBC show that like focuses on, you know, stuff like that? Or yeah, stuff but the of BBC that considers Doctor Who a family show. Yeah, so. all right, okay, yeah, for Doctor Who, maybe not. Yeah. Anyway, Rosita's anyway. like, "You're not the Doctor," and the Doctor's like, "What do you mean?" And this other guy runs up and he's like, "I'm the Doctor." And the doctor's like, what? And they just both pull out their sonic screwdrivers and then title well, sequence plays. Well, he, okay, he calls it a sonic screwdriver, and we're going to get there in a second, <laughs> but he calls it a sonic screwdriver. That makes it a sonic screwdriver. And, you know, watching this years down the line, the effect of wondering whether this guy's a, a later incarnation of the doctor or not is kind of lost because you know that, you know, he's. Yeah, the conceit. Not Matt Smith, and he's not Peter Capaldi, nor is he uh, always Jody Whittaker. The conceit falls apart. As soon as Christmas 2008 <laughs> was over, the conceit fell apart. <laughs> Actually, apparently Matt Smith had even been announced as the next Doctor before this, so the conceit uh, didn't even wow. work when the episode aired. Well, if you don't follow the news or anything, which I, I'm I mean, when I sure... watched this the first time, I was so confused. <laughs> Well, did you know anything about this? Did you know about like regeneration? So my ex- my explanation know? of what the doctor, what happened to the doctor, my dad was like, the doctor changes like bodies, and my da- and I was just like, okay, got it. The doctor's there. And my dad's like, we want to watch the next doctor, and I'm like, but wouldn't we want to start with the previous doctor? And my dad's like, just watch the episode. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right then. Smart ass 15, 14 year old Dylan. <laughs> anyway, yeah, but so. I was, like, really confused. I was like, oh, maybe he, like, I don't know. I, like, self-justified it to myself just to I move mean, on look, so I could focus on the episode. it's only an hour. Just get through the episode and then make your own judgments. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. It's, That's it's, why, I mean, yeah. Most of this is explained near or at the end, actually near or at the middle. But mm-hmm. Anyway, door opens up, and you see a Cyberman or a creature with a Cyberman sort of face on it. Yeah, Jim Henson side of as you <laughs> said. Yeah. It looks like sort of a, a well-made puppet. It looks like a like really a shaggy or... dog with a Cyberman face, to me anyway. Yeah, it looks like a very specific puppet that I'm thinking is from the Jim Henson universe. And mm-hmm. I, I can't remember exactly what it is. I don't might know. Be, might be something from Labyrinth. Uh, I don't know. Neither, neither do I. But I don't know. Might have been from the never-ending story even. I don't remember. Mm, I don't think so. 
That's yeah. the one that I have seen. I'm gonna say probably not. You should just watch Labyrinth. Honestly, like it's a pretty bad movie in my opinion, but just just watch it. It's a classic the, of cinema, though. Yeah, for the cultural relevance, significance. Yes. So this cyber shade, as it's called, why is it called a cyber shade? I don't know, but it's called a cyber shade. Yeah. And he's like, it doesn't make any noise. The, I mean, right. The doctor sort of explains it, at least as far as he understands, where it's like a modified Cyberman mm-hmm. or or another creature cyberized. They. I guess Speculate they didn't want like to a dog or bring a cat. back the Cybermax, <laughs> those classic Cyberman villains. But if I remember correctly, the Cybermats have already been in the new series. Yeah, I think you're right. In Pete's world, in right. uh, Age of Steel. Is, is this? Rise of the Cybermen. These I are the Cyber sh- Cybermen, yeah. These yeah. are the ones from the other dimension. Oh, they are the ones mm-hmm. from the other dimension. Mm-hmm. Did they ever say that in this story? Yeah, the doctor says they fell through time and oh, stole right. the Dalek yeah, okay. time controller. Yeah, right, right. From the battle in Doomsday. That was Doomsday. a big thing mm-hmm. in this. Yeah. My bad. No, you're good. <laughs> if you missed that one scene explaining it, you would never even know. So. No, it's actually, a, now that I'm uh, remembering, it's actually a couple different scenes where mm-hmm. they go into it in pretty heavy detail. Yeah. So, But it, it escapes. It climbs up a wall. Yeah. And the doctor try to ch- and the other doctors doctor. try to chase it and... Using a rope, though. To, to no avail. The the fake doctor, spoiler, he's a fake. It's uh, a fake. <laughs> like, lassos his way up. Yeah. And then, the you know, the the doctor hitches a ride. And then Jackson's like, I'm going to call him Jackson because it's confusing. Yeah, I'll call doctor, him the other doctor. Sure. Because at least when there's multi-doctor stories, you can refer to them as the 10th doctor and, like, the second doctor. But it's the doctor and the other doctor, the fake doctor. <laughs> Yeah, but they climb up and there's nothing, and the, the doctor's trying to get Jackson to, like, remember him, because he's like, you must be a future incarnation of me, because I don't recognize you, so don't you, like, recognize me? Jackson's like, am I supposed to recognize you? And the doctor's like, okay. Dealing with a bit of memory loss, he, he just speculates, yeah, it's true, you know, Jackson is dealing with memory loss. Yeah, the doctor seems to deal with memory loss a lot, so. Yeah, that was first, I think, established... You know, when the when the doctor regenerates, he has some sort of period of mm-hmm. either memory I think it loss. Was in it was the fr- spearhead from space. Third doctor. No, it was it was with Patrick Troughton as well. I mean, if you want to, oh yeah, want to call he like him reads not through the diary in in Planet of the Daleks. Uh, I think no, Power of the Daleks. Power of the Daleks. Not sure I knew how it was I remembered P. that. <laughs> I knew it was a P. <sighs> There's a lot of episodes to remember on this show. So the Doctor kind of, and well, so Jackson's like, yeah, they stole f- stuff from me, the Cyberman. And the Doctor sees he has a fob watch, and he's like, maybe it's in the fob watch. And there's this really intense build-up in the music, and the Doctor's going to open the fob watch because he thinks... I, I think this is once they go to the house. This is when they break into the house, which is like right now. Yeah, so. it's, it's basically right now. And Jackson sort of explains what's you know happening to London, mm-hmm. which is a string of grisly murders, or just two at least. Well, there's been multiple murders, and then everybody One. thinks Jackson Lake is dead, except he's not actually dead because they didn't find a body. They just assume he's dead because they didn't find the body. Right. Did you think it was a effective reveal that this guy is Jackson? Yeah, I, mean, I think I it worked. I didn't see it coming, but at the same time, I was like, oh, all right. You know, I didn't. I think it worked. Yeah, it worked. They built up to it pretty well. I mean, they didn't just pick a random person and be like, you're not the doctor, you're blah, blah, blah. They, like, introduced Jackson first. And, like, Jackson's missing, so they all think he's dead. And then when they go to the other doctor's hideout, he's got all of Jackson's stuff. And I think right. that's when the doctor figures it out, actually. Yeah, but- it's, it's, it's pretty obvious, I think, early on. I don't know if this is just me knowing that this guy isn't, you know, Matt Smith, not Peter Hopali or... Jodie Whittaker, but I thought it was pretty obvious that, you know, this wasn't a future incarnation of the Doctor. Especially once they go visit the quote-unquote TARDIS. I mean, it gets pretty obvious when his sonic screwdriver is just a literal screwdriver, and the Doctor's like, how is it sonic? And then he just hits it against the door frame, and he's like, it makes it sound, that makes it sonic. I think the Doctor made the same joke once. The real Doctor. Huh. But anyway, they go to the, the house, and they investigate. Yeah, they find these info stamps, which contain, like, all the history of earth i guess or london at least yeah i guess each one contains history of something different but the Since one there's they find one in the house uh, which, this is the house of like the reverend who died there was a we've got to mention there's a funeral for this reverend and all the like 
ho- hoity toddy rich people show up and then this lady this woman in red shows yeah, up and they're like Mrs. you're dressed completely Mrs. Hardigan, inappropri- right? yeah mm-hmm. Hardigan. they tell her that she's dressed completely inappropriately for a funeral yeah because she's dressed all in red Jackson which, Lake which watches that, I mean, the that's, that's the color of like you know prostitutes so mm-hmm. that that's also another reason why it's pretty obvious mm-hmm. or at least they make it as obvious as they can like I said before without just flat out saying it but you know half the people there die yeah, she uh, just brings the Cybermen out and they just zap them all. Yep. The Doctor and Jackson don't see the Cybermen. They leave before this happens. Jackson's watching the funeral from a distance and the Doctor's kind of watching Jackson from a distance. <laughs> They're a trail of following each other. And so some of them die, but some of them don't. She keeps some of them. And they're like, why do you need us? And she's like, well, I just need you to do something for me. And then, Yeah, this part of the plan, if I'm understanding the plan correctly, the reason why she needs them alive is kind of... She needs them alive to go get some children. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But uh, all right, sure. (laughs) All right, I'll buy it. (laughs) So in the house, the doctor and Jackson Lake find this info stamp, and uh, Jackson starts to remember a little bit of what happened. He said a Cyberman attacked him, and and they took something from him. They, like, forced him to change. He doesn't say regenerate. He says change. Right. One One of the info stamps contains the entire history of London, from 1066 to like the present day mm-hmm. and it's just a series of images i was like did you really capture the entire history in this series of images that seems to maybe repeat? there's like computer data encoded in it because clearly yeah. the cyberman just injected those into them like they're shooting up heroin so. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah 1066 if i remember correctly is the norman invasion of mm-hmm. britain i think so which is interesting. I don't know how old London is, and I was like, hmm, I, while I was watching this, I was like, hmm, I, something interesting to look up, and I, I never looked it up. But When London was founded, was that what you were going to look up? Yeah, or like how long that area has been settled, which is probably very long because it's next to a river. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so yep. I think now they go to the hot air balloon. Well, so first they fight off some Cybermen because Jackson remembers that he used the info stamp to zap them. And the doctor right, tries he, telling them to update the memory banks, and he's the doctor, and they're like, does not comply. Delete, delete, delete. Oh, right. They're attacked in the house, and they have sort of a fight going up the stairs. The, yeah, the doctor, doctor pulls a, a sword, a cutlass off the wall. He's like fighting them off with a cutlass, which is kind of cool. I really liked that. I thought it was kind of fun. Yeah, I don't think the doctor has really fought hand to hand in a pretty long time. Yeah. Probably. Um, I don't mm. remember the last time. Well, the third Doctor's sword fought yeah. the do- the master, so we know... The yeah, do- in the Sea it's Devils. A, it's already been established that the Doctor is uh, proficient with a sword. And the noose and Aikido. Bring back, yeah, bring back that Aikido. Back. I bring it back for the 12th Doctor. Huh. Well, that's also... I'm thinking, you know, we're, we're pretty far off from there, so I'll f- probably find out when we get there, but isn't that also because Peter Capaldi's favorite Doctor is pa- uh, Pertwee? Possibly. There's just a lot of references to Classic Who and the Twelfth Doctor's run, just all over the place. Huh. So, might also just be because of that. All right. In the Twelfth Doctor's run, they reveal that Venusian Aikido requires, like, proper Venusian Aikido requires, like, four arms or something, and the Doctor's <laughs> just, like, really good at it or something. <laughs> kind of similar to, you know, what they revealed last week, which is, like, six people, actually, are, you know, the Supposed TARDIS requires. the TARDIS. Right. But, yeah, they, they sort of make their escape, I think. Yeah, because Jackson blasts them with the info stamp, and then they, right. they go to Jackson's hideout. And, and Jackson is having sort of flashbacks to mm-hmm. hi, what you think is his regeneration, or it's it's really yeah. shot to imply that it's the Tenth Doctor's regeneration into mm-hmm. Jackson, basically. Yeah, in an alleyway in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> well, you don't really get a good actual shot of where all this is taking place, at least uh, you know in these scenes. You do think. later when they're later, taking yeah. away the kid. Yeah. Spoilers. That was the biggest plot <laughs> twist like, of this whole thing, to be honest. Yeah, but like, uh, we'll get there. I have some problems with how that's achieved. <sighs> so they go to Jackson's hideout and they show him the TARDIS, which is just a hot air balloon <laughs> painted blue. The doctor's it's, like, what is this? <laughs> it's it's kept in like some gas works facility, which doesn't sound all that outrageous now, but probably in the 1850s was a big deal that they have mm-hmm. this like gas works in the middle of the city he looks he's like paying off someone at the gas works to supply him with gas to power his hot air balloon yeah basically i don't remember this guy's name but i remember they uh there's a sign on the background like on the side of this gas works building and it's t-pain and co i was like wait (laughs) t-pain 
<laughs> he spelled P-A-Y-N-E, but ah, so still, Thomas Paine. Yeah, is that like a historic person that I should yeah, know he about? Wrote, he wrote that pamphlet in, in America, the, the one that's like, we need to declare our independence. I don't remember what the oh, pamphlet was called right, now, yeah. Thomas Paine. Yeah, I've read that yeah. like multiple times. All right, sure. But I'm sure it's not the same guy. Otherwise, he'd be like over 100 years old and in Britain and working as a gas works Maybe guy. it's his son, who's also <laughs> named Thomas Paine. Kind of like how George Foreman named all of his sons George <laughs> Foreman. Oh, God. So the George what? Foreman the second through sixth. Oh, all Jesus. his sons. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I think he was like, it's so I can remember all their names or something like that. I'm pretty sure there's some heavy narcissism, narcissism and like egotism at play here as well. It's that, or it's because he was boxing. He was a boxer, and and his his memory got ruined by the fact that he got hit in the head like <sighs> hundreds of times. It's a possibility. That's yeah, what some people theorize. Maybe, maybe. But what he says is just so that they can he can remember their names. I think is what he said. All right. He gave another like more legitimate explanation. But I don't know. It's interesting because it means like George the Sixth is the son of George the First. But anyway, yeah. I mean, when you when you when you get into the British royal family, you know the the, well, the yeah, first the, or I forget what that's called, but the yeah that part doesn't like carry it. Like if you can have George the First, and mm-hmm. I'm sure there was one, you know, long before you know George the. Second, you know, not mm-hmm. necessarily his son. I'm just making up these names. I don't know anything about the British royal line. Thankfully, not one of those Americans who's obsessed with British royalty for whatever reason. Yeah. Seems- no, but I know what you're saying. Yeah. In the British royal family, it's not like a con- continuous familial line. Right. So, anyway, back to the story at hand. The uh, Jackson's like, it's tethered aerial release developed in style. And the doctor's <laughs> like, right. Then the doctor's like, do you really want to know what happened? And Jackson's like, yes, please. Jackson also says that he's never been up in the hot air balloon. Mm-hmm. Jackson is also like when the doctor tries to tell the Cyberman that he's the doctor, he's like, you're trying to take away the one thing that's mine. And the doctor's like, uh, uh. Because <laughs> the doctor really, he's he's sort of beat around the bush mm-hmm. that he's the doctor. He hasn't told Jackson right. all that he knows, really. But they go back to his hideout, and this is where he sort of reveals it. Yeah, he pulls up one of the info stamps and he's like, yeah, so you were looking through these info stamps and you found this one, which is an info stamp of me. And he plays it. And this is the first time we get any footage of previous doctors in the in the reboot. Is it? Mm-hmm. We had, we had the drawings of the previous doctors in Human Nature, Family of Blood in huh. John Smith's notebook. But this is the first time we've had any like explicit footage or reference connecting the the reboot to the classic show, except for the fifth doctor showing up in Time Crash. Hmm. It's interesting, I guess. I mean, they even put... um. Uh, they put like a sepia tint on all the non-black and white footage so that it all looks the same. Well, I was also going to say they, they had the Eighth Doctor in there. Yeah. Which was nice, I guess. Yeah. I mean, he is the Doctor, so yeah, it does well, confirm that the Eighth Doctor is part of the continuous line of regeneration. Right, and, and that he has more, you know, adventures. Mm-hmm. That we didn't really see on screen because the Cybermen never met him on, uh, screen. on screen in his, you know, his one on screen appearance. Yeah, but what's weird about this is that this info stamp, I, the I, doctor I, says he, the Cybermen stole the info stamps from the Daleks, which means this is the Daleks info stamp. Yeah, I guess you're right. Which then makes it really weird that the, the retconned war doctor doesn't show up in this info stamp, considering all the war doctor did was fight the Daleks during the time <laughs> war. Well, whatever. Uh, yeah. Whatever. It's just a retcon yep. continuity issue. But, you know, speaking of the TV movie, I actually thought that Jackson was going to end up being the master or something like that, which honestly might have been a cooler reveal. Like, you know, this guy who lost his memory and he thinks he's the doctor, but it's actually the master. Yeah, but they've already done the master so well in the 10th Doctor's era. Uh, yeah, I, would, I mean, just bringing him back for, like, a sort of low-key episode like this. I mean, mm. I know there's a giant robot crushing things at the end. But it might have felt a bit underwhelming to bring him back here. I just think that that would, be, would have been a cool concept to use maybe in another story. Mm-hmm. That, some, that, you know, there's a Time Lord and he thinks he's the Doctor, but it's actually the Master. I mean, there's an audio drama where the Master basically goes to Unit and pretends to be an incarnation of the Doctor that Unit hasn't met yet. And then huh. just mucks things up with yeah, unit. Yeah, that's, that's cool. I mean, there's Master, the one we listened to, which mm-hmm. was 
you know, the master losing his memory as well. So. Mm -hmm. Anyway, then Jackson has a mental breakdown when he realizes he's not the doctor. He's just ordinary mathematics teacher Jackson Lake. <laughs> the doctor's like, that's not true. All those things you did, that's you. That's you. You saved everybody. So I'd say that's pretty good, Jackson. Yeah, I think he, he remembers more of the the quote-unquote regeneration scene now, which is that the Cybermen killed his wife. Mm -hmm. and that's that, not everything, though. That's one of the things Jackson's been referring to. is like, oh, they took something from me, but I can't remember what it is. So one of the things that he remembers is they killed his wife. And then so they, they kind of go out in the street, because it's Christmas now, the bells ring and it's Christmas now. They go out into the street and they see, uh, well, they see people like taking children. And yeah, they see, like, the they see, you know, groups of children following these guys who are the, the people that Hardigan left alive at the funeral. Mm -hmm. And this is where the, her plan started to seem a little strange to me. And I mm -hmm. guess later on, again, if I'm understanding it correctly, her plan was to control these four dudes Yes. And have them, like, sort of lead the children to where they needed to be led to. Yes. And I, I, I guess she only did that because they only had the ability to implant four mind control devices. That's how I'm justifying it. Like, well, we couldn't well, implant I think these in all these children. guys ran, like, orphanages. Huh. That's what I got of it. These people, these four were the ones who like ran the orphanages. Or there are at least people that children would like follow if told or something And then, like that. so they went to go get all the children and bring them to the, the cyber king thing. Yeah, that makes more sense. Still kind of a silly plan, but you know. Kind of whatever. silly, just needed the least children too, but whatever. <laughs> kind of temple of dooming it. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. That's exactly what I was thinking of when they actually got into the cyber king. When we see all the children working, I was like, is this just temple of doom now? <laughs> Is Doctor Who Temple I mean, of Doom? There is the lassoing thing, you know, which is oh, kind of reminiscent yeah. of, you know, a whip. Hmm, <laughs> Russell T, we're on to you. Uh, Jackson, there's also a moment where he, like, tells Rosita to go wait in the darkness, and she's like, no, but I can help. And he's like, the doctor's companion does as the doctor says. <laughs> and the doctor in the background is like, uh. <laughs> I think that's when he realizes it's not him. <laughs> <laughs> so the doctor the doctor's like I'm gonna go stop the Cyberman Jackson you just wait here and Jackson's like N because Jackson's busy still having his mental breakdown and then Jackson's like, like you know what get over it man it was just one person who died no I'm just kidding <laughs> yeah, but was someone important to him just your son being ripped out of your arms Jesus Jesus <laughs> he picks up this I guess, like, what would you call it? It's like those grenade... I don't even remember what you're referring to. He's got the, like, strap that's got all these info stamps on it. Like he, a, like, picks it up. Yeah, you know, like a Rambo, like, Gatling yeah. gun style thing that you put over your... You put over your shoulder, shoulder. it's just got, like, grenades on yeah, it. Yeah, I don't know what those are called. Yeah, I knew what they were called once, and the name is completely escaping me right now. <laughs> <laughs> that's really frustrating. But he picks up one of those filled with info stamps because, like we said, you use the info stamps to blast the Cybermen. Meanwhile, the Doctor's having a confrontation with two Cybermen and then Hardigan shows up and the Doctor's like, come here, you can you can still get away, you still have free will. And she's like, oh, you poor thing. I control the Cybermen. They listen to me and the Doctor's like, damn. And the Doctor chucks them the, the info stamp, his info stamp, and he's like corrupted the core and the Cyberman analyzes it and he's like, this core has been corrupted. This would damage cyber components. And the doctor's like, well, it was worth a shot. And this I man's just like, call it repaired, downloading yeah, it turns, information. It turns out they can just repair it with the press of a button, which I guess makes sense. Just like a hard reset type of thing. But So the Cyberman shoots up with his knowledge. <laughs> and then he's like, so you're the doctor. And they're like, we must delete the doctor. And, and Hardigan's like, yep, kill him. And then the doctor does the thing that he always does that always works. He's like, no, 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 wait, 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 wait. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> let, me just, let me just talk it out for a bit here. Because the doctor wants to figure out what the plan is before he dies, allegedly. And they're like, well, we're going to get the children, we're going to build this thing, and then we're gonna, the Cyber King is going to rise. And the doctor's like, Cyber King? You mean Cyber Leader? And they're like, no, no, Cyber King. That actually, they don't have that. No, no, no. Then the Cybermen get blasted by Jackson, who apparently knows where the doctor is having this random confrontation in an alleyway. But, but it's okay, you know, whatever. It's, yeah, whatever. Um, and then... If I remember correctly, I think they kind of just run around for a bit and blast yeah. some Cybermen, which was cool. 
which was nice seeing some Cybermen get blasted. They run around for a bit into the Cyber King. Yeah, the the Cyber King has sort of a chamber where he's uh, being it's, it's built. I think this was this was the head, right? I mean, Hardigan was controlling from the head. Uh huh. So like the rest of its body was under Ground. the Thames, basically, because it yeah. emerges from the river. So I, I yeah, I guess this is the you know the head. And the cyber leader, who we haven't mentioned, uh, who, there's actually something about the cyber leader I wanted to mention, which is that his brain is sort of exposed. Mm-hmm. And there's a line from the doctor. I think it's actually, you know, around this time, you know, three, four, three quarters of the way through the episode. The doctor says they're like people, but they have no brains or something like that, which I guess is his way of saying they have no emotions. Mm-hmm. But you can very clearly see the cyber leader's brain yeah. in this. Mm-hmm. Which is terrifying, by the way. <laughs> It's just like a. It his, isn't his done head is like that slightly well. clear. But it isn't done that realistically. It doesn't look like too realistic of a brain. It looks realistic enough. Yeah, sure. Anyway, Hardigan gets into the control room. Mm hmm. And, the, and she's like, So you're going to become the Cyber King? And he's like, Nope, we said we would follow the Cyber King, not become it. And then she's like, What? And he's like, Guess who's the Cyber King? <laughs> it's you. And she's like, Ah, you <laughs> promised I wasn't going to get converted. And they're like, We lied. <laughs> Surprise! They actually straight up said that was a lie. <laughs> yeah, they had a. There was a weird way that they, you know, he sort of said that. So that was determined to be a lie, I think. Yeah. But she gets into the chair, and the Cyberman helmet type of thing comes down onto her head mm-hmm. and starts cyberizing her. It's like a cyber crown. But it doesn't fully cyberize her. It creates a new type of being, which is half cyberized and half human, which is, like, I guess, just like, half cyberized. Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, one end of the spectrum is human and the other end is the Cybermen, so. Well, apparently it was supposed to, like, control her, but her mind is strong enough to control the Cyber King because the Doctor sees, the Doctor sees on, like, a screen with Jackson and Rosita. They're looking at the screen and the Doctor's like, that's weird. The code is, like, being rewritten by some outside force. And then Hardigan's like, you guys thought you could control me? Haha, <laughs> my brain is too powerful for all of you. I control you now. And they're like... Oh no, alert, virus in system, alert, kill her. And then she just blasts the cyber leader to kingdom come. Yeah. Takes control. You know, the cyber king is revealed to be a massive robot. Massive steampunk <laughs> robot, which is kind of cool. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, there's a lot of steampunk Doctor aesthetic Who, here. Right, the, and Doctor Who hasn't really done steampunk mm-hmm. at all, really. I, I don't think I can Basically think of, ever, I think. Yeah, which is interesting. Okay, so that's like a classic subsect of, like... Not that classic. It's fairly new, actually, you know, you know 25, Well, I mean, it's like a staple, I guess, is what I'm and saying. Then, yeah, now it's a staple <laughs> now, at least. Of science fiction, steampunk. So, it's kind of surprising that Doctor Who hasn't even touched it with, like, a 10-foot pole at all. Until now, I guess. Well, there. I mean, steampunk was first, quote-unquote, invented or, you know, started in the late 70s, early 80s, so I'm not too surprised that the classic series didn't really Mm -hmm. touch it. The new show, not surprised that the first season didn't have anything to do with it, but, you know, yeah, you know, four four seasons in, basically, you know, Christmas special, but still four seasons in, Mm -hmm. uh, I think is a good time to sort of do something with it. To finally address it. (laughs) The elephant in the room. The metaphorical elephant in the room. I'm surprised they didn't have the Doctor go to, like, a steam-powered planet that was just all... I mean, they kind of, another thing about it, they kind of touched on it with the clockwork robots, but... Yeah, that's true. I mean, the the new series has done cyberpunk in at least some capacity. Right. It's never gone, like, full, like, really dark and gritty type stuff, but... No, but... Has at least had, like, you know... Stuff where it's like it's an AI control, or it's like an alien hooked up to a computer and it's controlling mm-hmm. everything, or something like that. Well, also, what they're doing here, they're kind of doing a meld. And then, but then again, when you think about it, uh, you know, a lot of people cite like Neuromancer, uh, mm-hmm. and I hate to go back to that because of you know just how big it is, and there's more like there's much more at least now to Cyberpunk than just that book. People always yeah. cite that as like no Neuromancer, no Matrix, but like really, it's no Doctor Who, no Matri- Cyberpunk. I mean, I don't know, because Doctor Who invented the Matrix. It invented the goddamn Matrix. <laughs> uh, with yeah, but... things like the Deadly Assassin. But, like, how much of that actually seeped out of, do- like, the bu- bubble that is Doctor Who, right? And I mean, in terms of... Uh, maybe didn't influence William Gibson, but in terms of influencing the Matrix, like, yeah, I think it did. I mean, maybe. 
especially since you know the Wachowskis have interviews where they're like, "Yeah, we're big fans of Doctor Who." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so they probably saw it. But I mean, The Matrix is mostly not even neuromancy. It was simulacrum, simulacron, Sim- simulacrum simulation, simulacrum simulation. But that's that's theory. It's not like fiction, right? But but I mean, but the things in that book, like it doesn't it doesn't directly address like a compute. That book doesn't directly address like a a world within a computer that people are mm-hmm. living in. Whereas Doctor Who like does, and again, Doctor Who like if you look at the Matrix from Doctor Who compared to the Matrix from the Matrix, Doctor Who's not really doing too much interesting stuff with no. it. So I well, mean, until later when the Matrix can like apparently predict the future. But anyway, well, sure. And and since you bring it up, you know the the Wachowski Matrix is like what if we took this concept that Doctor Who did and didn't really explore and like p- incorporated a bunch of like this theoretical stuff from like mm-hmm. Simulacrum Simulation and like all these other books as well, right? To make it cooler. To make it more exciting to watch. Yeah. The Matrix Which, then, was so dull to watch but, on Doctor Who. <laughs> but again, like, yeah, I don't know. Maybe I'm underselling the first Matrix, but I feel like a lot of the theoretical stuff, especially when you get into, like, how you can tell or if you can even tell whether the real world is a Matrix or not, like, quote-unquote mm-hmm. real world in, in Reloaded and Revolutions. Yeah, Revolutions. <laughs> that we called Revelations for, like, years, but... Such a dumb name. I'm sorry, Wachowskis, but what the hell? Well, there was all that Christian imagery and stuff in there as well. Which would have made more sense to be called Revelations, but yeah. anyway. But whatever, you know. But the point was just that, like, onto this con- oh, right, Doctor, Who, Doctor Who's done cyberpunk before cyberpunk was even a thing, but Doctor Who's like Did never Did cyberpunk even... before cyberpunk was cool? <laughs> but, like, steampunk, it never even touched... I'm just waiting for the inevitable diesel punk episode. Let's go. God, what is diesel? I mean, I can imagine, but like, what is <laughs> diesel punk? It's steampunk, but with diesel. <laughs> because apparently diesel is important <laughs> enough to have its own thing. <laughs> I don't know. It's that it's. I think it started almost as like a joke term, but it's come to mean like, you know, that very uh, like late 50s style sci-fi where everything is like well steampunk as a term and i don't remember which came first steampunk or cyberpunk but i remember and actually now i'm forgetting whether this was steampunk or cyberpunk and i think it was cyberpunk but in the in the letters between and i think they're you know co- communal i guess letters between some of the earliest cyberpunk authors, I think William Gibson was involved in this, mm-hmm. or it might have been steampunk, and I can't believe I'm forgetting. But it was first though, that term was first used to refer to characters who did things in these worlds, like mm-hmm. cyberpunks was originally yeah. how it was used, and then that term just became the name of the whole genre. Mm-hmm. It was their first originally used to refer to like people, characters, like again I'm forgetting cyberpunks or steampunks, mm-hmm. but. Uh, yeah. Well, then, well, at some point, it just became like a suffix you attach to things to mean like yeah, different, punk. yeah, like diesel punk. What are some other ones? Bio punk. Oh God, is that a real one? Yes. Do you remember in high school when we came up with leech punk? Oh, yeah, <laughs> leech punk. Where everything is powered by leeches. <laughs> That novel I had an idea for and, you know, never followed up on Sea of Leeches or whatever it was. Yeah. <laughs> Should write that now. Great. <laughs> leech. You can invent leech punk. <laughs> but how would they be powered by leech? I don't think that's, I don't think we ever got that far in, you know, thinking about this universe. How would leeches power anything? No, we didn't get that far. We just went, they'd be powered by leeches. And that was as far as we went. We were like, they'd be powered by leeches. And every time we thought about it, we're like, just don't worry about it. They're powered by leeches. <laughs> we could have leeches running in little hamster wheels, powering everything. <laughs> anyway, the Cyber King emerges. Well, Jackson saves his son. The Doctor saves Jackson's son. Right. The, the then other, the Cyber King emerges. The other thing that Jackson lost was his son. The Cybermen took his son away from him. I forget why they didn't just kill his son. Because they need the kids to build the oh, Cyber King. right. But here's my problem with his son. I would have been more okay with this if this kid wasn't just... Mute? Not, right, mute. And he look, he wasn't even... It's probably a five-year-old kid, so, you mm-hmm. know, you, I'm not... You can't fault him too much, but his face was just completely expressionless. 
Yeah, he didn't act. Yeah, he didn't act. At all. No. He, cr- okay, he quote cries, unquote, <laughs> when the Cyberman are taking him away, but it looks like they took water, streamed it down his face to look like tears, and were like, you good, bro. Yeah, and, and again, this kid is probably no more than five years old, but it right. did it did just take me out of the moment. Mm-hmm. Thankfully, he's not in much of the episode from no. now on. I mean, the rest the, of the, the episode goes by really quick, actually, because the Doctor, they actually, they get off the Cyber King before it rises, and the Doctor sees it, and he tells Jackson to stay with his son. Rosita was helping all the kids get out of the Cyber King because the Cybermen were going to delete them, but they saved them all. And then the Doctor just goes and steals Jackson's TARDIS the, and the balloon. flies up into the air. And if I remember correctly, Jackson doesn't get to go up in the balloon. Nope. Bummer. Bummerino. I think there's something... I mean, at the end... Doesn't the end imply that he's going to have adventures in the balloon? Or not? Not really. He has a son to take care of. Yeah, but he can just... You can bring your kid up in a hot air balloon. I guess. <laughs> the Doctor also... Hardigan is, like, taking control of the Cybermen now, and they're like, you have emotions. And she's like, yes, I have passion and rage. That makes me more powerful than ever. As a cyber... Right person and they're like okay i guess we'll follow yeah. you come i mean this is actually kind of a weird thing because you, like i mentioned before you know one end of the spectrum is human the other end of the spectrum is cyberman right mm-hmm. so wouldn't her having still having some level of emotion just put her somewhere in the middle of that spectrum rather than like making her more powerful Oh, yes. The re- I guess the reason why it makes her more powerful is because... She has, like, the invulnerability of the Cybermen yes. with, like, the emotions and that help humans survive. <laughs> yes. That help the humans win. I mean, it's it's true, though, because, like, remember Evil of the Daleks, where the Daleks were looking for the human factor because yeah. the humans keep beating the Daleks, so they were trying to figure out why. And it turns out the human factor is just emotions. Yeah. And I think the Daleks and, did that Dalek, again yeah, later Dalek, on. Dalek Khan, Sek, and yeah. um, whatever the other one's name was. On second, no thought. I don't remember something, what it was. Something. Um, but yeah, they they were made possibly more powerful, or at least changed by Jast. Yeah, ja- ja- There was four Jax. of them. There were four of them. Second con were the most important, and there was like Jast, I think. Yeah. I don't and there was one with a T. I'm pretty sure. But Tim. yeah, <laughs> no, the point was like. The humans always win, or the doctor always wins because he has emotions. So that's what the dogs are trying to figure out. Like, why do the humans always win? Well, anyway, it doesn't the, work out very well for Hardigan. Well, because the doctor just separates her cyber connection and then she like realizes what she's done. She's no longer cyberized and she screams and she just blows up. Which this kind of indicated that she was somehow being controlled by the Cybermen before she was even cyberized. Yeah, there's a possibility. That's what I, that's what... It seemed like to me, actually. Yeah. Because the doctor's like, I've opened your mind probably for the first time in your entire life. Right. The doctor first offers to send them to another planet using the Dalek time manipulator that he steals from them, that they stole from they, the Daleks. They refuse, obviously. And there's there's this line that the doctor says, I think. Not I think, I know he says it, which <laughs> is that Hardigan could have... Like, her mind was great. She had the potential to stand up to the Cybermen, at least in some capacity. Mm-hmm. She could have been like great, but you know she. And a mind like that deserved to live, right? But then but she, she chose doesn't. not to. And then the doctor's like, "You made me like this. Yeah, uh, you did this." And then he zaps them, and she's like, "You didn't even do anything." And he's like, "Yeah, I did. I separated you from the consciousness, this Cyberman." We forgot to mention Hardigan's completely black eyes when she gets right. cyberized. They're just they're just completely black completely black which was actually terrifying when she opens her eyes first it's just completely black like, whoa <laughs> apparently she I wore mean, black contact lenses but it didn't cover her complete eyes so had some special effects artists had to go in and like remove the edges yeah that's black. interesting i mean that's there are like probably dozens of horror movies that do that i think mm-hmm. i've seen it in some movie or other so i didn't find it that creepy honestly so she opens her eyes and Anyway, she screams, they blow up, and then the doctor teleports the falling Cyber King out of London because it's going to fall on all these people. He teleports yeah. it using the dollar. I mean, I'm pretty sure this thing. thing this thing is like marching through London, basically. I'm pretty sure it's, it steps on you know people and destroys thing and things yeah. in its path. I mean, Hardigan's even like, why are my people not rejoicing? I was like, well, probably because you're killing them. <laughs> and it also fires that big cannon it has and that laser beam. Yeah. 
So probably yeah. hundreds of people die. Yeah. And apparently Russell T realized after the story had been transmitted that there was a way better ending he could have written for this where Hardigan redeems herself and she's the one who teleports the Cyber King out when it's falling instead of the Doctor. And apparently he can't bear to live with himself for there being a better wow. ending than the one that was transmitted. <laughs> so I guess he beats himself up about that a lot. It's I don't okay, know though. Would it be a better ending, do you think? Yeah, I guess. I mean... I guess because it would have shown Hardigan redeeming herself in the end. It's It's been done before. It was done in the Santaran Stratagem and Poison mm-hmm. Sky. It's been done countless times before. It's not like something that out there, something that amazing that you go, whoa, she redeemed herself. It's right. Incredible. But, yeah, I, I mean, you know, I, I don't know. Yeah, because I think maybe one of Russell T's main arguments is that he didn't want to just have to pull this MacGuffin, the Dalek time thing, out of nowhere for the Doctor to be able to teleport the Cyber King away. He's always like, that was kind of weird, you know. You know, actually, I really don't... I'm not invested enough in this story. I didn't think it was good enough to like even care one way or the other, probably. That's fair. And then... The Doctor meets up with Jackson. Jackson. Well, so Jackson has everybody start applauding because Jackson's like, he's never been thanked. That's not true. <laughs> it's far from the truth. <laughs> so they start applauding and the Doctor's like, he waves and he lands and he goes and he goes to talk with Jackson and Jackson's like, come to Christmas dinner. And he's like, no, 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 no. I'm going to leave. Yeah, he, he refuses as he usually does when people invite him to dinner, you know, dinner or, or just to celebrate their victory. But, you know, for the first time, I think the Doctor accepts. Well, he refuses, and then he goes to the TARDIS, and then he shows Jackson the inside, and Jackson's like, oh, this is sick. And then he's like, oh, it's too overwhelming, and he runs out. And then he's like, okay, it's no longer a request, it's a demand, because he asked the Doctor why he's alone now, because he's always had companions. He's like, oh, some of them leave because they should. Some of them forget me. Some of them Donna. die. <laughs> some no, of them he die, doesn't, but he doesn't, he doesn't say, say that. that. And Jackson's like, okay, well, it's a demand now for well, he, yeah, people he's, we lost. And then it seems like what I thought was going to happen, and I completely forgot how this ended, so I thought it was going to happen, was the doctor was going to... He tells Jackson, he's like, okay, go on, man. You've changed my mind. You actually changed my mind. And he's like, if anyone was going to be the doctor, I'm glad it was you, Jackson. And then he tells Jackson to go off, and I thought he was going to go into the TARDIS and just, like, he was going he's gonna to be like, I just got to get something from the TARDIS and go he, in, and he was going to leave, which he's he done usually, before. Yeah, it's what he usually does. But then he doesn't. He actually walks with Jackson to go get Christmas dinner. Which, this is actually a, a sort of a nice thing. It's sort of a, you know, if you just watch the Christmas specials, it's sort of a development mm-hmm. over the course of those. I mean, I know he does that when Martha leaves as well. Right. But, you know, uh, I don't know. I just thought it was a you know nice touch there or whatever. Yeah, I thought it was nice. The Doctor finally goes off to go celebrate Christmas with some friends. Interesting resolution to the Russell T. written Christmas episodes. I mean, there's still technically one more, but it's like the first part of the regeneration story, so. Eh, yeah, all right, sure. I mean, I don't know what's coming up. Uh, we have Planet of the Dead next week, and then that aired on, on or around Easter, I think. And then there's Waters of Mars, which I don't remember where it aired. And then we have, uh, I, I think then it's... Yeah, and then I think it's End of Time Part 1 and Part 2. And End of Time Part 1 airs on Christmas, and then Part 2 airs on New Year's Day. Huh. All right. It's interesting. So Christmas 2009, New Year's Day 2010. To the now we're in this best of my getting Getting to this decade. <laughs> yeah, we're getting close. <laughs> Can you believe that, like, three weeks from now, we'll be, like, uh, like, one season from now, we'll be halfway through... We'll be halfway through the reboot, basically, one season from now. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, as far as this episode went, maybe just coming off the heels of series four, series four felt a little underwhelming, um, maybe. especially because like if you watch this as it was as it aired, this would have you know come months later. Mm-hmm. So you know, just getting any new Doctor Who at all probably would have been you know interesting enough to keep you entertained. I didn't find this episode to be. I didn't find it bad. I, I, I well, just thought so, it was, you know, good, like solid, I guess, but nothing. I always perfect. like the Christmas specials because, especially when you get to like the Peter Capaldi and later Matt Smith eras, because it was like the seasons get really dark. And then like at the end, the season ends on like maybe a bittersweet note or a sad note or a happy note. But then you get the, at the end afterwards, you get the Christmas special, which is always like kind of lighthearted and 
carefree, a little bit carefree. I mean, not super carefree, but like it's lighthearted and it's just kind of fun. And I always like the Christmas specials for that. And that, I, that's why I think this is like a nice Christmas special, especially coming like right off the heels of that devastating <laughs> departure where Donna has her mind erased. I think it's nice to have what's, I mean, it's not, su- it's not a super consequential Christmas story by any means. It's like really lighthearted and carefree and it's kind of like a fun romp. I mean, it's not great, but I enjoy it because it's like, it's like the opposite of, it's like a reprieve after series four. Series four like battered your emotions and then you get this fun Christmas special at the end. And then we're going to go into more emotion battering like starting from next week. So take the reprieve while you can. I mean, not to undermine, I agree with most of what you just said. So not to just undermine all of that, but like I think getting your emotions battered if that's effective is more fun than watching an episode like this where you're just not too invested. But, hey. I don't know. I never really understood the Christmas specials till I actually watched them on Christmas, and then I understood. Huh. It's like, the Christmas special is supposed to be something that's fun and light, and you can all sit around on Christmas Day and feel good about at the end of the day. I mean, yeah, it's fun to be completely emotionally devastated when Donna has her mind wiped, but Christmas is supposed to be a happy, fun time. Like, when you sit around at the TV on Christmas to watch Doctor Who, you don't want to come out of it crying, although you do when, like, when the Doctor regenerates, because he always seems to regenerate on Christmas, but... Well, I mean, see, that's, that's <clears throat> actually the thing, and this isn't, total, this isn't a discussion that's totally related to Doctor Who, but I, guess, I think we're touching on it right now, is when people say, I don't know, I th- like, people say fun... When referring to like TV movies, even books and other quote unquote art form or other like products, Mm -hmm. uh, when they say fun, what they really mean is like silly or lighthearted. And I don't agree with that. I think, like you mentioned before, getting emotionally battered or seeing something really sad or seeing something depressing can be really fun. Mm -hmm. Well, I think you're probably just using the word fun then to mean enjoyable rather than lighthearted and. And I and based on like the etymology of like the word of enjoyable and just how that word works in other languages and like soulless, which is a, actually a pretty big word in the history of English language text at least, mm-hmm. and and probably French to some extent because of how related French and English medieval stuff is. But like just knowing more about like that word and that concept and how that's evolved at least in like English language stuff Mm -hmm. makes me believe that fun like the word fun I don't know if I want to use say should because language is always changing but like I agree with using the word fun to mean enjoyable I think that's what it means in like this context Mm -hmm. rather than like lighthearted and silly it's just evolved over time probably I mean, there's two ways to use it nowadays, and I think a lot of the confusion here, obviously I have a problem with this, which is pretty, I find pretty stupid even myself, because I'm always the one who's like, yeah, language is always changing, and I watched the Stephen Fry language thing, which I can link, it's recently, which is pretty cool, um, where he like really rails hard into people who like try and keep language static, Mm -hmm. and I agree with most of that, but like, I don't know, I just, I don't think... At least personally, I never use the word fun to mean lighthearted and silly. I just use it to mean enjoyable. Right. And there's often confusion. Like when, I mean, you've probably heard discussions before. Like, yes, yeah, so that was really fun. And they're like, what? Everyone died at the end. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everyone died at the end. I don't know. I mean, I agree with you. I think fun can just be used to mean enjoyable and not necessarily like silly or, or carefree or lighthearted. Um, although that I think that use is enjoyable is like falling out of favor i think less people use it like that than the other way which is whatever my word taking it back we're reclaiming the the word the word fun the word fun (laughs) yeah i mean anyway i just think it's good but not great this story yeah i'm probably in the same boat i guess i have a lot of nostalgia around it though because like i said it was the very first episode of doctor who i ever watched so yeah that's kind of fun (laughs) You know, uh, if I were to, like, if this was the first episode I ever watched, I'd probably be, and that's why I think you're like being possibly too reasonable about this. I would be like, yeah, this is the best episode ever. This is literally the best one. Well, then again, Unearthly Child episode one was my first episode, and I don't think that that's even close yeah. to the best one. So maybe not. I don't know. 
I don't know. For a while, I thought it was the best, and then it just gets superseded <laughs> by things that are better. I, I do think it's like probably. Midnight. I, I, I do think Unearthly Child episode one is like one of the strongest of the classic show, though. So start off real strong, and then uh, and then taper off, and then just fall off for a, a cliff. few seasons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not even tapering off. It's literally just falling off a cliff for like yeah, until, unearthly, until Keys of Marin. A nursing child just falls off a cliff in terms of quality actually, as soon as they actually go back in time. Actually, you know what? No, I wouldn't say until Keys of Marin. There are definitely moments of brilliance in the Daleks. Moments? Ian. And that's, exactly. that's the prince. No, no. That was in Marco Polo. <laughs> that was a moment of brilliance. Wasn't Marco Polo before Keys of Marin? Uh, was I don't know. I think Marco wasn't Marco Polo the fourth story. I think so. Unearthly Child, Daleks, Edge of Destruction. No, Edge of Destruction was after the Daleks. Yeah, Daleks is the second. Yes. Edge of Destruction. Uh, Marco, Marco Polo. Polo. And then Sensor. No, no. Keys of Man. Sensor Rights was season two, I think. Yeah, Sensor Rights was season two. Okay, whatever. Remember. Yeah, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You can email us at thedoctor.decadentvegetable.com. Questions, comments, concerns, angry rants, love letters, your thoughts on the Cyber King or Cyber Queen. You can find us on YouTube at Decorative Vegetable. You can find us on Apple Podcasts and Google Play at Trust Your Doctor. Be sure to leave a rating if you like the show. Check us on Facebook, Trust Your Doctor. Like us on Facebook. Also check us on Twitter at TYD Podcast and follow us on Twitter. And next time we're watching Planet of the Dead. But until then, the end.